Um, so um, we'll have about 15 minutes at the end for questions. Please do ask some. He has such a, a beautiful mind, and it's a shame not to get to tear into it. I'm certainly very excited to get the opportunity to. Um, for those of you who uh, have read uh, Who Killed My Father, you will already know what a compelling and moving book it is. For me, it is the perfect juxtaposition between a very intimate private story showing um, uh, a sort of political nature of sort of uh, humiliation and the shame of poverty. Um, I was wondering, um, did you find this book easier or, or more difficult to write than your previous two? How did you come about writing it? Uh -huh. Uh, writing is also always difficult, as you know, uh, <laughs> at least for many writers and at least for me. So I don't know. I, I didn't. I didn't uh, expect to write that book. I was. I was writing another book that will become my next book. In fact, so one that doesn't exist anymore. But one day, um, my father called me, uh, and he told me that he wanted to see me again. And you know, when I was uh, 15, 14, 15 years old, I left my family and I went to the city to study and I was blah, 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 the, f the first in my family to, to escape and, and to study and to have a chance to do that. And, and very quickly, it became for me uh, impossible to talk with my father. And not because we had an argument, not because one day I shut the door and, and tell him I hate you, but just because our life and our way of living and our way of thinking and our body languages and our daily life became so different, you know? And my father was a street sweeper in, in, in a little town in the north of France. And I was in Paris living my gay life and reading Peter Hanke and Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. and, and it became suddenly completely impossible to talk with my father. And we stopped talking. He had my number, I had his number, but we didn't talk anymore. And when I was uh, 21, my first novel, The End of Eddie, was published. And then the second one, History of Violence. And one day my father called me after years of silence and he told me, uh, oh, you published books. Uh, I wanted to tell you I'm, I'm so proud of you and I want to see you again. And that was very surprising for me because when I am a gay man and when, and when I was a child, my father would say that gay people should be killed, that should be gay. he would even say that gay people should be sent to concentration camps and these kind of things. And that's why it was one of the reasons of our bodies being completely split. Um, and, and so when he called me and knowing that my books uh, deals with sexuality uh, uh, and other things, but also sexuality, when he told me, come and, come and see me, uh, it was so bizarre. And so I started to I took a train and I went to see him in the small town up north in France where he lives. But when I opened the door, after years without seeing him, I saw that his body was uh, completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. And my father is a, a young man, he's uh, 50 years old. Uh, he doesn't have a, a, a difficult disease to deal with like cancer or leukemia and everything. He doesn't have like a big disease that would uh, 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 destroy his body or, or cause problems to his health. But just the state of his body is due to, to the place he belonged to in our world, in our society. So as soon as I saw my father, I, I opened the door and I saw he had trouble breathing. That's the beginning of the book. I, he had trouble breathing, he had trouble walking. And I thought like, what happened? And I felt a kind of a emergency to write uh, that book. And that's why I started to write that book. And I wanted this book to be short because I wanted, to, I wanted people to cross the entire life of my father in one, in one week, you know, mm -hmm. in one hour and a half, mm -hmm. in two hours. I thought there was a kind of radicality in it. And, I was, and, and, and that's, that's how it happened. But uh, I, I never thought that I was going to write this book uh, before. Uh -huh. And so it's interesting that you say that sort of crossing uh, your father's life in an hour and a half, because it feels like such an immersive experience. Like you leave having completely experienced your father's life and uh, really been through the nuances of your relationship. And um, it reads to me like part like a sort of campaigning battle cry and part like a love story or a love song to your to your father. And mm. um, was that kind of your intention? You want to do something very political, but also something that was that was reflected on your relationship with your father? Yeah, uh, absolutely. The thing is, I studied. So I saw my father, as I was telling you, and I decided that I was going to write about him. And I opened my computer to to work and I realized that I knew nothing about him, you know? And so I was thinking, how am I going to write about a man that I don't know? How am I going to do? 
the only clue, the only small things that I knew came from my mother, because in my family, like in a huge part of the working class, it was the woman role to talk. Talking was considered something effeminate for my father, so he would never talk, never talk about his life. We never had a discussion together. So I said, I have, I have two options. Either I do a, a, an inv investigation book, or I can do a book with, with the silence being a constitutive part of the book. And, and so I started to write about these memories that I had with my father and, and this distance that I had with him. And, uh, and that's why I don't, I don't know if it's a book, if it's a love letter for my father, if it's a book about love, but rather maybe it's a book about um, why, why is it so difficult to say I love you, you know? Why is it impossible sometimes to say I love you? And what I describe in the book is that someone like my father and many men in the social class and in the milieu in which I grew up, they were trapped by the masculinity. And the masculinity meant to never say I love you, to never express your feelings and everything. And so my father never, t never told me, except when he was drunk a few times, he never told me I love you, you know? Mm -hmm. And I remember when I moved to Paris to study and I became a, a philosophy student and sociology student, and I met some people of the bourgeoisie and I would see fathers uh, hugging their children it was so exotic for me. Yeah, I, radical. I, I was, I couldn't believe it. And frankly, I was like, it's so bizarre. Like the, the father is so effeminate, you know? <laughs> I, because I had these stupid values from my, from my childhood still in my mind. And so I, I, it's one of the things that I try to do, to, to, to talk about in the book, is about how the impossibility for a man to express his feelings completely destroyed the life of my father in a way because with my mother, my father never said I love you to my mother mm -hmm. because for him it was an effeminate, feminine things to do and at 45 years old my mother left him because she didn't feel love enough because he never said to her I love you and my father was, it was, my mother was the love, the love of his life, you know, when I, when I see him today he still tells me I will love your mother forever and she left me and, and, and we see here that love and the ability of talking about love is deeply politics, you know, mm -hmm. because maybe if our society were fighting more against masculine domination, maybe my father would have been able to say I love you to my mother and he would be with her today uh, and he would be less destroyed by, by, by his life. And so it's really this exploration of this impossibility of talking that I, I try to deal with in, in this book. And you do so beautifully, I think. Do you think there's a, a real connection between, and like I definitely felt that I read that for, and recognized it in sort of my own working class communities, uh, and relation between toxic masculinity, that sort of very destructive masculinity and poverty mm -hmm. and sort of the, the structure of poverty. Yeah, yeah, clearly. I thought that, you know, when I, when I, started, to, when I started to write, when I started to write books in France and I, I wanted to write about the milieu of my childhood because I had the impression that this milieu was never represented, or uh, never enough, and very rarely in a good way. Um, I wanted to write about it, and so I was looking for books who would talk about poor people, about working class. And suddenly I had the feeling that so many books, even some contemporary books, um, uh, were talking about class, the way people would talk about class in the 50s and in the 60s, you <laughs> yeah, know? Yes. It was very strange, as if history didn't happen for so many writers. Mm -hmm. I don't talk about you, I don't talk about yeah. Annie Ernaud, I don't yeah, talk yeah. about so many people who are trying to do something different. But, you know, that people were talking about class as if the LGBT movement never happened, as if the feminist movement never happened, as if the anti-racist movement never happened. And we should consider that all these new struggles that appeared uh, in the middle of the 20th century, the feminist movement, the LGBT movement, and, and etc., are chances to rethink about deeply about politics, about social class and everything. So what I do in talking about the life of my father in Who Killed My Father is I try to build a, a contemporary language to talk about class in general and to talk about my father in particular. And, and as you were saying, I say in the book that um, in his childhood, for example, my father, in order to build his masculinity, 
and, and he had to build this masculinity because if he was not doing it, people would have called him faggots like they were doing with me during my childhood. So he had to build this masculinity and to build this masculinity meant to reject the school system mm. because it, it sounded like a feminine and an effeminate thing to like school, to have a good relationship to the children, to, to the teacher, sorry. And it was a masculine thing to reject the authority, to reject culture, to reject the school system. And so because of that, my father stopped school at 14 years old and he had no diplomas. And because he had no diplomas, he had very difficult jobs during his whole life, very badly paid that destroyed his health. So we see here that the question of masculinity is a class issue. And so that the, the, the distinction between politics and class politics and identity politics, this, distin this distinction is, is an illusion, it's a lie. There is no such a difference, you know? Like, as, as, as a working class man, my father was, uh, uh, um, uh, um, his life was determined as much by, by masculinity than by class. But it's not only that, it's two things that were, you know, superpo uh, superposed, superposed uh, 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 um, put uh, one on the other, but it was, it was deeply mixed and it, it was the same thing. And as I was saying last time uh, here in this place, anyway, in my childhood, every single class issue was always a gender issue. You know, like mm. to be a working class man always meant to refuse what appeared as the effeminate bourgeoisie, you know, the men hitting small plate, the men uh, hit, uh, crossing their legs, uh, the, and, and everything, like all, all, our all our identity as working class people in my childhood was deeply a gender identity. So the, the distinction between gender and class is, 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 is a lie, in fact. It, it works together uh, all the time. Yeah, of course. And I wondered, um, so obviously you're the first to, of your family to go to university. Uh, I read that you grew up in a house with no books, which is not uncommon for a, a sort of working class household because you can't afford them. And also, as you say, the educational structure isn't always there. Um, how, did you, how did you start writing about your experiences? And also though, because when we first met, um, we met in France, and I'd been asking lots of journalists, who are the, work, the great working class like French writers? <laughs> and they said, well, there's Annie Arnaud, and there's Edward Louis, and you know? <laughs> um, and uh, so that's why we met, because people put us in touch. And, um, and I remember saying to you, like, why is there not a greater culture for this? Because in France, the, it seems to me that that, that poverty line, that the sort of, the, the, the politics of class are so defined mm -hmm. um, what gave you the courage to write about your own background even though you didn't necessarily have like a model for that if, if you didn't have a model for it I, I had a few models like like Annie Arnaud in France or Didier Ribon um, uh, but but still it was very uh, minority you know it was very it was very difficult to find patterns because it's a it's a, it's a social structure, the fact that m most of the writers come from middle class, from a privileged milieu, from the little bourgeoisie, from col cultural bourgeoisie, and extremely rarely uh, from, po from poor milieu, from, from poverty, from, from working class or non-working class or, or post-working class, you know? And, and as soon as I started to write, you know, I, I, I felt that I couldn't I couldn't write about anything else, you know? I couldn't, I, it wasn't even, it was not a decision, you know? There, there is a scene that I often recount from, from my teenagehood, when one day, you know, the, uh, Le Clésio, the French writer, got the Nobel Prize for Literature, and I was home with my family, and we were watching the news, you know, the very mainstream news, uh, TF1, conservative, <laughs> uh, stupid news, and, um, and, uh, and, and they would never talk about books, obviously. Uh, and, and suddenly they were talking about it because it was a French Nobel Prize, and so they were happy and they were proud, and uh, as if they had anything to do with it. And, and there, there was an interview from Le Clésio, and I was, I was a teenager, and I remember Le Clésio was talking about uh, the way he builds his uh, uh, fiction, the way he builds the characters, the way he builds the chapters and everything. And I had this very naive thought. I thought like, why is he creating uh, fake characters with fake pains when we are here, like real people with, with real pain, you know? Why is, he, why is he not talking about us, you know? No one, will, no one will write about us, you know? If you are Toni Morrison, if you are William Faulkner, if you are <laughs> Margaret Thatcher, people write about you, they talk about you. And we would, no one will talk about us, you know? No one will talk about us personally, you know? 
because I wanted someone to talk about my mother. I wanted someone to talk about my father, you know? It's like when you love someone, you want this person to love you. You don't want this person to love someone else as a way of loving you, you know? And it, it, was, it was a little bit the same thing. I didn't want to write fiction about the working class and it would have been a way of talking about the milieu of my childhood. I wanted to write about the people of my childhood. And, and I know, of course, that it was a naive way of thinking, and I was a teenager, and uh, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, um, and, and, and a lot of writers that I admire, Marguerite Duras, uh, Toni Morrison, uh, uh, they wrote fiction. So I'm not doing a statement about fi against fiction. I'm just saying that me, with my body, with my history, with my past, I, I couldn't afford fiction. I, could, mm. I couldn't do that. I could, it was impossible. There were, I, my feeling of emergency was too big, you know? And, and plus, after that, and it, was, it, was a, it, it came out as a surprise for me, I realized how, auto, how subversive autobiography was, you know? Yeah. So it mm. encouraged me to, to go on, because when you, do, when you do autobiography, you are saying to people who read you, these people exist while you read, you know? This suffering, this pain, these people are suffering while you are in your sofa reading something. Okay. And it makes the bourgeoisie feel so bad, and it's an important thing to do, you know, to address the people, what are you doing? What are you not doing? You know? What are you doing against this bad world? What are you not doing against this bad, this bad world? And I, I, I understood, out of surprise, that autobiography had, had this strength, you know? And, 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 and I think that it's not... Uh, uh, par hasard, it's not by chance uh, if you just uh, are going to publish a, a, yeah. a memoir, if, uh, <laughs> if Ocean Wrong writes about his life, if, mm. if Carlo Knosgaard writes about his life, if uh, Tanisi Coates writes about his life. I think there is a strong avant-garde movement today of autobiographical writing because we are now realizing how powerful it can be both aesthetically and, and politically. Mm. I mean, it's interesting that you say about like the power of it, because obviously your book was um, just so globally successful. Um, and I'm curious about how it felt to come from where you, I am, you know, I have uh, sort of <laughs> similar feelings to you, to come from where you, are, you came from and to end up, say, here in this beautiful building, <laughs> talking to all these wonderful people, um, and then traveling around the world and having the sort of success you had. But then also, I, if you feel like talking about it, I'd be really interested in like sort of the response that a lot of the, the establishment or the media had to that and why you think it ended up being sort of so controversial. Yes, I mean, <laughs> I was, I, was, I was just writing about my family, I was just writing about my parents and about my past, and I, suddenly I realized that truth was polemical, you know? And suddenly, like, so many polemics started to fall on me. And uh, so many things, because as, as if these people couldn't bear the fact that I was forcing them to see that reality, you know? To see the fact that they don't do, they don't do anything against that. And it came out also as a surprise, it was extremely violent, this, this sometimes this way of like these polemics that were created after I published my books and everything. I, I didn't write in order to, to, to do that. I, I, I understand that it can be a good thing. Uh, it, it means that people feel uncomfortable and, and good literature uh, should make uh, people feel uncomfortable. So I'm happy with that. But, but in fact, it was, I don't know. But, but in a way also, I was talking about it before, in a way, I think that this violence, this violence from a part of the establishment against me, uh, not all of them, I don't complain, no. I'm a happy person, don't, don't worry, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, the violence from a part of the establishment, in a way, saved me, you know? Yeah. Because when you, are, when you are in what we call a transfuge in France, a transfuge, when you are a class traveler, when you come from one class like, like you and you go to another class, at the beginning, you know, when I moved to Paris, when I arrived in Paris, I wanted to be like the bourgeoisie so deeply, you know? I wanted to be like them. I, it was my dream. I wanted to, to sit at the opera like them and to have the same body language than them at the opera. I wanted to, I wanted to have their way of moving. I wanted to have their way of speaking. I would, have, I would have given everything to be like them, you know? And I think it's normal, you know, I was 17 years old and I was meeting uh, people at school who would tell me, oh, when I was a child, we went to Vietnam. When I was a child, we went to Japan. When I was a child, we went and during my childhood, I was watching reality TV 10 hours a day, you know? And I felt like, why do I have such a different childhood? And, and, and I wanted to be like them. 
And, and because they never accepted me completely, a little bit like Toby in the, in the, in the novel of, uh, in the masterpiece of uh, Alan Olinger's The Line of Beauty, mm -hmm. who is an outsider and arrives in a very privileged milieu and the privileged milieu make him understand that he will never be like them. He will never be part of them. And, and because they make me understand that I was not like them, I didn't succeed to be exactly like them and, and they created a weapon against them, you know? Yeah. Because, because I failed being like them and now all I have to do is to fight against them, fight against the people who are part of the establishment and who don't do anything against violence, who don't do anything about inequality, who reproduce them, who don't care about poverty, you know? Yeah. It's amazing, it's amazing how, how people don't care about poverty, in fact, when you when you suddenly go to, I don't know, to a literary party in New York, you go to a literary <laughs> cocktail in New York, and you see that people, they just don't, they just don't care, you know? They just don't care. They, they are drinking champagne and they have a waiter bringing them a glass of champagne, and, and, and they take the, champagne, the glass of champagne and they don't, they don't even look at the person, you know? I remember one day I was in one of these parties, and I wanted, to, I wanted to scream to the waiter, but I'm on your side, I'm not like them, I'm not like them. I wanted to just go, go on the table and to say, I'm not like them, please. Uh, the, uh, and and I, I thought like, like, all the things you have to learn, all the body techniques and the body strategies that you have to learn in order to ignore people that much, you know, it's mm -hmm. very difficult. I wouldn't be able to do that, I would break the glass and everything. Uh, and, 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 and all of that, you know, I want, because I will never be completely part of these people, even if I am not, of course, part of my childhood anymore also, but because I will never completely be part of that, it, it's good for me because uh, I am a little bit uh, outside and it helps me uh, taking a step back and to see how the structure works and to see what is going wrong, I hope. And do you believe that informs your writing, that sort of, because I was going to ask, like, obviously that sense of otherness, um, your gayness, do you think that all contributes to sort of uh, that sense of perspective, which enables you then to, to write about the structure as a whole? Yeah, I, I really think so. It's, in fact, it started in, my, it started in my childhood, because as I say in Who Killed My Father, for, for someone like my father, the world we were living in was, was obvious, you know? Mm. The way it was working was obvious. But as a queer person, uh, because I felt, I felt excluded and um, I started to say, okay, there is something wrong in this world. There is something wrong in the way it's, 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 it's working and it's uh, working in a bad way, you know? And so it really, and that's why, for example, I, I guess that my sexuality uh, is one of the um, reasons why I write about class this way, you know? The fact that when I talk about the class identity of my father, I talk about sexuality, I talk about masculinity, and I understand how much it was important and, and, and how, how much it determined everything during his life. Or maybe if I, if I was a straight man, I would have not, I would have not seen him, seen it, you know? Yeah. And because uh, I remember when I, when I started to write The End of Eddie and, and History of Violence, in which I was talking about the racism in my childhood, uh, the homophobia, uh, the people voting uh, 60, almost 60% 60 for the National Front in the village in which I grew up. Some people told me, um, oh, but uh, uh, don't do that because it's doing a stigmatization against uh, poor people and against working class. And I'm, I was saying, no, I'm just including more people in what you call working class, you know? Because if you talk about, and if you write about, if you do literature about working class, about working class is not a good word, but post-working class, poor people in general, if you write about them, but you don't write about what it is to be a woman, what's to be, what it is to be a person of color, what it is to be a transgender person or a, a lesbian, uh, then you talk only about a very few part of this world, you know? So I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm in favor of minorities, so it's okay, but at least people have to be honest about it. And so what I w was trying to do was to include more lives, more bodies, more voices in, in this category. Mm. And, 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 but that, that meant to fight against a certain way of talking about class, a masculine way of talking about class. And as you were saying, that's probably due to my, 
position as a, as an, a sexual outsider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm interesting. I sometimes say that I feel like when you leave, uh, like I, I agree with you, working class is like a terrible term and not at all like, uh, you know, sort of justifiable for all of the things that that includes. But like, it's like a hinterland. You're neither here nor there. You know, mm -hmm. you don't belong quite in the place you are, but you also can't, can't really go back to the place that you are. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you, how, what's your, how do you identify now? Do you identify as working class or do you, do you sort of, do you think of yourself as more in your present life? No, yeah, it's a, it's a complicated question. For, for sure, it, will be, it would be an obscenity to say that I am working class. Uh, it would be an awful uh, thing to say because I have privilege that my father don't have. I travel, I am able to pay my rent, I am able to go to the restaurant if I want to go to the restaurant. And so I'm not working class. Um, and as I was saying before, I'm not completely part of the bourgeoisie. So it, it, objectively, I am, but physically and subjectively, I am not. And it creates this, this kind of tension. And it really depends, in fact, it, it depends on the, in, on the place where I am talking, you know. And it's the beginning of Who Killed My Father, because when, when I, at the beginning of the book, when I, I return to my father's place and I open the door, suddenly I understand that it will be difficult to talk with my father, because for him, suddenly, I embody the, the dominant class, you know, the dominant class that uh, humiliated, mm -hmm. humiliated him, that humiliated us, you know. And so as soon as I see my father, I hate my body in a way, you know, because I know that I represent something violent for him. And, 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 and I know it from my flesh. I know him from my flesh because when I was a child and, and we would see someone privileged, someone with money, someone with culture, we felt so inferior, you know, we felt so humiliated, even if the person was kind, even if, the, like, we would, we, it was like a, a sociological, psychoanalytical, uh, psychoanalytical mirror, and we would say, I don't have that, I don't have that, I don't have that, I don't talk this way, I don't dress this way, I don't do what they do, and it was a constant objective humiliation, in spite of what people were doing and what were saying. And so, what does it mean to suddenly become that body? What, what does it mean for me? This is at the center of the book, even if I don't, like this is the, a kind of ghost that crossed the book. What does it mean to, to become the body that humiliated me during my childhood, you know? And I see that, like, how much I try to, to, to talk with my father, to talk with my family, but no matter what I do, no matter what I do, it's, it's violent, you know? What am I going to say? If you say, what did you do yesterday? I will tell him, I was in London, I went there for free, my publishing house paid me a hotel room for free. Yeah. I had a dinner for free, you know. People were there, they, they paid to listen to me talking, considering the life that he has. It, it, it carries in itself a, a violence of, of, of the border, of the, of the border, border between what some people have and what, what some other people don't have. And so really I'm trying to struggle with that in, in, in the book, in like what it is to, to talk about and to talk with a man that I never really knew, but that I can't really know either because how can we talk together? Mm. That's a, and I think that's a, unfortunately uh, something that uh, is, is not, it's not about my experience, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a structural experience. And I'm sure you could say the same thing, <laughs> more, or less, more or less exactly the same yes. thing. And that, then, then, then a few people, several people could, could say it. Mm. Uh, so. Um, I want that. I want, I want people to feel that. I want people to feel that as soon as I write about my father, I write about potentially their father, you know? And uh, because even the issue of masculinity is not only uh, concerning the working class, mm -hmm. it's, uh, so, uh, even if there are some differences linked to the milieu, but, but anyway, yeah. Obviously your book's been translated to so many places now um, and has been received in so many contexts. Has it changed the way you think about class in France and like the universality of poverty and shame and humiliation that goes with it. Like I feel like that's a very common theme in all of my work mm -hmm. here in the UK, that desperate, desperate sense of shame at poverty, which you did not invite, which you were born into. Um, has traveling around with the book and seeing how people have responded to it, has that changed your idea of sort of the, the sort of universal sense of what it means to, to grow mm -hmm. up poor and marginalized? Yeah, like, I mean, one of the, things that really surprised me uh, while traveling while traveling for my books was to see how similar the situation is like everywhere you know and and 
people always have the feeling that it's different somewhere else, you know? So when I, people interview me and tell me, uh, uh, oh, but the class system is not exactly the same in our country that it is in France. But in fact, when I travel and when I talk with the people and when people send me letters to talk about their lives, it's incredibly similar, you know? So of course there are some differences, small differences due to the government, due to history, due to... Um, but but the, the structure of the society, working with excluded people and included people, persecuted people and included people, it's very, a kind of sadly universal thing. That's the, po that's the starting point of, of Hook in My Father when I say that what we call politics, and in fact what we call society, uh, is the border between bodies exposed to a premature death and bodies who are protected, who are privileged, you know? And if you are a working class person in France, you have 50% more chance to die before you're 65, to die, which means your, your, your life is finished. You don't do anything, you don't have friends anymore, drinks anymore, sexuality anymore. Uh, if you are a queer person, you have a four, uh, uh, four times more chance to kill yourself uh, during your childhood or your teenagehood. If you're a black person, if you're a person of color, if you're an Arab in France, you can be killed by the police. There is more or less uh, one person every month in France killed by the police per person of color. Um, so it means that depending on the body you have, depending on, on how your body is per being perceived by our world, uh, if you're a woman, you can die from masculine violence like it happens all the time. Um, you are exposed to a premature death. And for me, this, is, this should be the very definition of politics, this should be the very definition of what we call society, you know? What is more important than life and death, you know? Because death it means everything is offered. I mean, people in this place <laughs> don't necessarily <laughs> believe it, but I truly believe it. Uh, but, uh, and so, uh, for me, it was, so th 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 that's, what I, that's what I figured out when I, when I saw my, my father, I thought like, he belongs to this category of beings, mm -hmm. he belongs to this category of bodies, that are exposed to a premature death, and that's the story of his life, that's, a, that's, a, that's the story of, it, of his body. And, and, and it's very bizarre because in the public space, in the public sphere, it's as if the people who talk about politics are constantly hiding what politics means, you know? So the politicians make you believe that politics is a matter of gestion, a matter of strategy, a matter of responsibility. But no, it's First and overall, it's a matter of like, am I going to die? Am I going to live? Am I going to survive? And so that's why there is this, what some people call the political li uh, part in the, in the book, in Who Killed My Father, in which I talk about French politics during the 35, uh, the 30, 35, 40 last years, and how it affected the body of my father. But what I wanted to say, what I wanted to show with that book is that for my father, a decision by, by Macron or a decision by Sarkozy is as intimate as his first kiss or the first time he made love, you know? It's just part of the history of his body, you know? When you're a migrant today and you want to come to France and Macron refused to welcome you and his government refused to welcome you, it means maybe you will die in the sea, maybe your daughter will die in the sea, maybe your wife will die in the sea, maybe your husband will die in the sea. What is more personal than that, you know? And so, for me, you know, it's a, it's a paradox, but in a way, this book is not more politic than history of violence and the end of Eddie. It's just it's just about the story of the body of my father and 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 what happened through politics. The day that one one of the president and and as you probably know, the French system is a very presidential system uh, uh, created by Charles de Gaulle, uh, who was a, a crazy monarchist and wanted to be king of France. And um, uh, Sartre and Marguerite Duras, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Marguerite Duras wrote beautiful things about it. Uh, you should read it. Um, uh, it's a very presidential thing. And, and so when you have a president that say, we are going to stop reimbursing some medicine mm -hmm. uh, for my father, it meant I can't buy this medicine anymore, you know? So I have a headache, so I have a stomach ache, so I, so I have pain in my body. And so it was just deeply, deeply personal, you know? So I don't, I don't care if people who read my books don't know Macron, if they don't know Sarkozy, if they don't know their name. What I want to show is a structure in which the more you are socially dominated and the more you are hit by politics, the more your life is determined by politics. I could say that today, I, I, I hate what's, what Macron is doing. I, I hate what uh, uh, Trump is doing in the United States. But when I'm in France, 
or when I'm in the United States, what they do, uh, it's, it's not taking food out of my mouth. It's not exposing me to death. It's not exposing me to direct death. But if you're a Mexican migrant, if you're a working class person, uh, it's completely different, you know? And so the more you are excluded, uh, and the more you are exposed to politics, so also to, to talk about the life of my, of my father as a life structured by politics, if, is for me a way of talking more generally about the condition of the poor people's lives, you know, of my people, the people I, I was part of, of my childhood. Have any of you read the book yet? Yeah, isn't that end part where he speaks about his father in relation to the political decisions they make absolutely extraordinary, absolutely, genuinely breathtaking? Um, my favourite bit is where you talk about, is it five euro a week they take away or five euro a month? Uh -huh. Is that right? Yeah, no, five euro a month, it's, it's, the, it's, it's Macron and his government, and, uh, and since it's presidential regime, uh, Macron is the person that can say stop mm. when something happens. Uh, the other can, cannot say stop or they can be fired as ministers, you know. Uh, and, and so the, his government decided to withdraw uh, five euros from uh, precarious people, uh, a, a welfare program that was called uh, APL, uh, APL uh, which is money for poor people, uh, students, working class people to pay their rent. So it's five, and, and they, they withdraw five euros, uh, and at the same time they were cutting tax for multi-billionaire people, uh, and they were cutting tax for people who, ride, who buy a private boat and private jet. And, uh, and when they were doing so, they were saying, oh, but five euros is nothing, you know? But I remember from my childhood that uh, with five euros we would buy a pasta for two days, with a tomato sauce for two days, you know? So for us it, was, it meant two days of food, you know? And, and, and it meant, am I going to eat for two more days or not? And these people are so disconnected from that. They, don't, they do politics and they don't understand anything about politics. They do politics and, and they are so clueless, you know? And even at some point, I remember in my, in my trajectory, when I moved to a small, but the big city of the region before going to Paris, uh, the bigger city uh, in the region in which I grew up, you know, sometimes the school would take us to theater and they would very often ask uh, one euros or two euros to, to, to go to theater and they will pay the, the difference. The school would pay the difference. And, and very often my father and my mother, they, they, they didn't have these two euros to go to theater. And, 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 and the, the people that I w were studying with me in Amiens, uh, they would tell me, but even when you don't have money, you have two euros, you know? <laughs> and so, and so the, the notion of nothing, mm -hmm. the notion of emptiness, the notion of, of I don't have was deeply different, you know? And, and I see it today in Paris when I see some of, even of my friends who are writers, artists and everything, and they say, oh, I don't have any more money, and we are at the restaurant, and I know that they are going to pay, and I'm saying like, because when I was a child, when we say nothing, it meant nothing. It meant that my mother would tell me, can you go to see the neighbor and, and beg for a couple of uh, pa pasta packs, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when these people say five euros is nothing, it means that, they, that they, just don't, they just don't understand, you know? They just don't understand. And, and so for my, they, call it a, they, they, they call it a political decision, but uh, my father called it, am I going to eat tomorrow, you know? Mm -hmm. So the notions of what politics means is, 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 is very different. And my father is talking about personal issues. And that's why Who Killed My Father is a personal book about the life of, of him, mm -hmm. of his. Um, can we talk a little bit about the yellow vest? <laughs> yes. I know you're... <laughs> Edouard told me before he came that he was exhausted talking about it because in Germany they're just all obsessed. I've, I've asked for one question, which I believe he's not going to grant me. Um, so I read that you said that what, one of the things that shocked you about the yellow vest protest was the, the way that the the way that sort of your peers around you insulted the people who were um, taking part in the Yellow Vest protest, but that if they insult those people, they're also insulting your father, and that's why you decided to come out in support of them. Um, can you talk a little bit more about why you decided to support them and, and how that sort of fed into to this work and your work generally? Mm -hmm. I don't know, for me, the, the Yellow Vest movement was a, an area, a space of, of truth, you know, finally. And, um, you know, there is this very beautiful idea from uh, Gilles Deleuze, the French philosopher, uh, when he was talking about uh, May 68, the riots of May 68 in France, Gilles Deleuze was saying that um, 
when people talk about May 68, they say that it was the emergence of, of dreams, of utopia, of imagination, of dreams of another society. But Gilles Deleuze was saying, in fact, it was very powerful because it was quite the opposite, because it was a little bit of truth, finally. You know, people were saying, I want to feed myself, I want to have sex, I am a woman and I want to have sex with women, I want, to be, I want my body to belong to me, I want to uh, uh, have the right to abortion, I want to make love with the people in my university, I want to, and, and, and it was a very moving and powerful idea from Gilles Deleuze to say, it was so powerful because it was finally a space of truth. And I think that truth is one of the rare, more rare or rarest, what do we say? Uh, Whatever you know. <laughs> it's one of the rarest thing in, in, in the public sphere. Mm. You know, it's very rare. And what happened for me with the Gilets Jaunes, with the Yellow Vest, that suddenly people were saying, you know, soon it will be Christmas and I can't buy a gift to my children. People were saying, I can't feed myself. People were saying, my mother is dying a few kilometers away and I can't pay to go to see her and to take care of her. And I was, I was suddenly thinking, like these sentences, politically speaking, are much more powerful than all the technocratic discourses about responsibility, about, uh, uh, you know, like all this lie. In fact, like our political uh, conditions are full with lie, you know, full with, the, with this very violent hypocrisy. I don't know if you know this very famous scene from England where uh, Brown uh, was talking to um, a working class woman and she was telling him, uh, uh, I'm a I'm, I became ashamed of, it, uh, of, of voting Labour because you don't do anything for us. And, and, and Brown uh, tells her, no, no, we are supporting you, we are fighting for you, we are on your side, we are uh, making your life better. And then Brown go in the car and he forgot that he, I still had the mic. And it's like, like uh, who was this crazy woman? And uh, uh, who'd, uh, she was just a bigot from the Labour Party. And, 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 and in fact, this scene was so important because it was like, this is how politics works. It works with, with lie, lies at the core of its structures, you know? And so when, when, this, when the Gilets Jaunes movement appeared and, and when social movement in general appeared, uh, like in 2005 against uh, police violence and racism in France, a very, a, was a very important social movement, um, it was finally some truth, you know? So finally some people. And, and it was the same thing in literature in a way, you know? When I started writing, I would open French contemporary books and I would think like, what are they talking about, you know? In which world do they live, you know? It's not the world that I know. And, 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 and so I thought that it was important and it, it was important to, 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 to support this movement uh, as a left-wing person because it was very important to, to, to create a left-wing energy and a left-wing dynamic in this movement, you know? Because when you have a movement in which people say, I suffer, uh, I suffer from starving and everything, the language that will be used can be very different, you know? Do people are going to say, I suffer because of migrants and women's rights? Or are they going to say, I suffer because of the government and the dominant class and the inequality system and the way it works? I think that every single social movement is also a struggle of language and, and therefore of, of bodies because the language makes decisions that will affect your body. And, and so I thought that it was very important to be here. Of course, I know that there were some homophobic things. I, th I knew that there were some racist, anti-Semitic things. Uh, uh, I know that, you know, I know that I wrote about it in my two first books and as I wrote in the essay it was very, it was very funny because, or sad, not funny, but when I published Israel Violence and the End of Eddie, I had a, a big part of the, of, of the conservative establishment who were telling me, oh, uh, you talk about racism, you talk about male domination, you talk about uh, homophobia in the middle of your childhood, uh, but uh, this is not true, uh, there is an authenticity in the working class and people are good and people are, are good living <laughs> yeah, and everything. <laughs> and and yeah, now, yeah. When, when there is the Gilets Jaunes movement and these people are revolting, they say, oh, but they are awful uh, racist, they are awful homophobic people. And so at the end, the question is not what are they saying, the question is how they do to make people shut and they can contradict themselves to, from one day to the other as soon as the working class guy, me, shuts up 
other gilets jaunes shut up and they can contradict themselves as soon as we don't talk about poverty, as soon as we don't talk about misery, as, as soon as we don't talk about uh, exclusion. So what I was saying it was that I know that people are saying bad things. I know because these people, part of the movement, are like my father, they're like my brother. Some of them are lost forever. You know, I had some people in my family who were ideologically so deeply racist, who would do Hitlerian cross on their cars and everything. So some of them was maybe hopeless, I think. But many of them, they could, they could have changed very more or less quickly and more or less easily. I remember that a lot of people in my childhood, they were always hesitating between voting for the left and voting for the far right, you know? And it's something that you very rarely see in the dominant class because people are either right, center, left, but they don't hesitate between two things that are considered so different. But it means that these people in my childhood, people like my father were saying like, who is supporting me, you know? And, and so that if, if, if the progressist people are strong, if they offer them a space to talk about themselves, then part of these people, and I believe a, a, a big part of these people, can move from one side of the political spectrum to, to the other. Mm -hmm. mm, I absolutely agree. Um, I think we're going to open it up for questions now. I could literally talk to you <laughs> all night. Um, but I'd love you guys to have an opportunity to ask something. We've got a roving mic. Um, does it, oh, look at this. Hands up everywhere. Yeah, you just... <laughs> Do keep putting your hands up you and keep an eyes together. <laughs> right into it. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thanks Merci. so much for your books and for this fascinating conversation. Um, we talked a bit about toxic masculinity and uh, you described so well how um, gender stereotypes affect both men and women uh, in the same way. And uh, I was wondering what you thought about the importance of men speaking up about that and because you're quite a rare uh, masculine men voice talking about these issues. Uh-huh. Uh yeah, I, 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 I really think that, uh, anyway, like, it's very bizarre to, for me to say toxic masculinity because it's like saying two times the same thing. <laughs> so <laughs> so we, can, we can call it masculinity. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, I don't know, like, it, it, it probably comes from, from m m my, my queer body and the fact that uh, since the very beginning of my childhood, I understood that I was on the same side than women, you know? And it's not by, it's not by surprise, it's not by chance if, if many of, 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 of the gay artists uh, uh, talked about women, addressed the issues of gender, like you can think of Xavier Dolan in the movie, uh, Pedro Almodovar uh, in the movie, uh, uh, Milieu Field. And so, of course, I understood that I, I, I was sharing, uh, I was sharing a, a certain fate, a certain destiny, even if, of course, as a man, there were some things that I didn't suffer from, you know, uh, that a woman suffers from. And, and uh, so, um, I don't know, it's very difficult for me to answer precisely your question because it became part of my, part of my body, you know, as a lot of queer people, as a lot of queer men, when I was a child, at school, my only friends were girls, you know? Like, I, I didn't connect with the boys, I, was, I didn't like soccer, I didn't like the, the male uh, sociability. And, and so my mother, who was trying to convince herself that I was not gay, would always say, uh, oh, he's so, he's, he's so attracted by girls because he's with girls all the time, all his friends are girls. And I was like, but no, that's the, quite the opposite. Like, we all tough boys have boy, uh, friends who are boys. <laughs> and uh, my, my, my friends were girls because I was gay. <laughs> And, uh, and, so, and so since the very beginning, because of this biographical trajectory, there was something, uh, yeah, so, so something, in, something in common. And, uh, and so it's not even, I don't know, it, 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 it was obvious for me. It was obvious. And also to, also to talk about the, how my father suffered from masculinity, but also to talk about everything that he enjoyed from that. It's also important to talk about that. The fact that he was going home and my mother was cooking for him. My mother was uh, cleaning the house for him. Uh, he could go where he wanted. Uh, and my mother, if she, wanted, if she wanted to go somewhere, he would ask her where and when she would come back. And, and so it, it's not because he suffered from that that he didn't benefit from that uh, at, 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 at the same time. And that's the important thing to keep in mind when we think about masculinity and the violence of, of, of masculinity. But it's true that there is a, an entire field uh, of new questions also uh, that opens about that. You know, in France, I am part of the, of, of the Comité Adama that fight against uh, police violence towards uh, people of color and who was created by Assa Traoré, 
a French activist. Her, her, her brother was killed by the gendarme uh, uh, two years ago, and she created the Comité Adama, uh, was the first name of, of, of her brother. And, and, and she's going to publish a book uh, with my friend uh, Geoffroy de la Gannerie. It, uh, it will be published pretty soon. And in this book, because they are my friends, so I read the book uh, in advance, um, they talk about like, uh, how it affects in, in the suburbs of Paris, where uh, uh, most of the excluded people of color live, uh, how it, being a man and being a woman like, affect differently your, your life, uh, and the relationship to the penal system, for example, the men who are being put in jail and who don't have access to school, even less than women and everything. So I, I, anyway, sorry, I'm talkative, but I, I think that there is an entirely new field. And that's what also I try to do with Who Killed My Father is not, is not saying like, I'm going to talk about class and race and gender and sexuality at the same time, but more than that, how can my knowledge of sexuality or how can my knowledge of gender can challenge the way we think about uh, class, the, thing, the way we think about inequality, you know? So, so it's not an addition. It's not an addition of several ways of fighting of several, but it's, it's the way that every single struggle, even if they have their own individuality and their own temporality, but how, how each struggle is a way of completely re-challenging re, re um, how we fight in other areas, how we fight for other lives, how we fight for other bodies. And so masculinity, I think that today if we really want to renew the class analysis, I think that masculinity has to be a very, very, very central uh, thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, can I ask, in the circles you now move, the literary circles in France, the people who are drinking the champagne, <laughs> not serving it, um, are they more comfortable talking to you about your, your sexuality, your sexual identity, than they are about the poverty mm. which you also write about? Which makes them more comfortable to mm. speak about? Mm. Mm -hmm. No, it's a very, yeah, it's a very as, as Kerry was saying, it's a very interesting and important question. Um, it, in a way, it took, it took time for me to, it took time for me to understand the uh, masculine violence and the homophobic violence of the dominant class. Because as soon as I escaped from my milieu, I thought that the privileged class were so much more welcoming to different sexuality. <laughs> Which is, in a, in a, in a way, it's, it's a little bit true. I mean, in a way, it's, it's easier to be gay here tonight in a literary event than to be gay in the village in which I grew up. So it's important to be honest about that and not to be in the old-fashioned flattering discourse saying uh, working class uh, is like anywhere else, life is like anywhere else. I don't believe it. But, but still, I, figure, I figured out uh, so many mechanisms of, of, of violence, of, of, of homophobia, of, uh, and, and you know, like for example, my, my second novel, uh, History of Violence, is, is dealing uh, with rape. I talk about, uh, about sexual violence and about a rape. And uh, it was very surprising for me to see that a huge part of the, of the, of the, of the media, not a huge part, a small part of the media, but a strong part of the media, uh, were doing everything in order to try to show that what I was talking about was wrong, that, the, that, that it was fails, that it was a lie, you know, which is a very basic rape culture, you know, as soon as you have a victim testifying, to put all your energy in order to show that the victim is responsible, that, and uh, I would have never imagined that to be that violent, you know. I think that maybe deeply in my body, and I'm ashamed of it, and that's why I say it tonight, maybe somewhere deeply in my body, when people were talking about rape culture, maybe somewhere in me I thought that it was a little bit exaggerating, you know? Like because we, we don't understand, we have structures in our mind and people transmit, pass some discourses and ideologies along to us. And even when you are the most, most left-wing person, you don't realize that you still have some so social conservative structure in your mind. And when I experienced it directly, you know, uh, in spite of the medical evidence, in spite of the destruction of my body in the few days after the sexual assault and everything, people were, were ready to lie, when, you know, were ready to say. And so it really took time for me to, to figure out that, to understand that, to see that it was a, a, a very, very strong sexual violence in this, in this milieu. And that's what we, 
that what we saw with the Metoo movement uh, and with what was called La Ligue du LOL recently in France, where we realized that some journalists, so-called left-wing journalists from a newspaper uh, like Liberation, uh, were harassing uh, LGBT people and women for month and month and month, for years, destroying them, pushing them almost to suicide and everything, just because they were women or because they were gay. And so there are so many things that I'm still uh, figuring out, you know? And so even if they pretend to be more open, you understand that it's just another way of being violent. It's not, it's not they are not homophobic, they're just differently homophobic. Yeah. Um, and so I will have to write about that one day. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Someone there two <laughs> you allied um, toxic masculinity with humor. Um, and saying you're talking about the same thing. So what is a mere male heterosexual to be? I don't think, I hope I'm not toxic, um, but what is my identity to work towards? Because if the equation is that masculinity, I assume that's maleness too, perhaps you're using the words differently. Can you speak a little bit louder? Sorry, is that my too, too near or too far? <laughs> Can you put Sounds it? like a metaphor. <laughs> Life and a um, sorry, too close. close. Um, so, if you allied, the, if you're saying that masculinity and maleness are the same, as a male, where am I to place myself, or indeed, much more important, the young developing men in our society mm -hmm. who have an identity crisis? Mm -hmm. If you say, if you say it's all toxic, that's not helpful. I shouldn't think you are saying. But where do you see the place of a non-toxic masculinity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're right. It's a, uh, you are right. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strong and uh, it's also a very important question. Uh, because you know, there are uh, writers that I deeply admire, like Jean Genet, and uh, who were obsessed with masculinity, and they loved masculinity, and they were singing masculinity uh, so much. Uh, Jean Genet, in the Diary of the a Thief, uh, uh, in his books, he, was, he, he had a kind of like extreme fascination for, for masculinity. And so my, my, my idea and my ideal, uh, and I don't know if it can happen one day, but when I talk about masculinity, or when I talk about identity and, and what we are, it would be that masculinity is an option against, among, among other options, you know? Uh, the, the violence of, of masculinity is because masculinity is something that is uh, 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 compulsory for a man, or you are being excluded, or you are being called faggot, or you are being called freak. And, and, and so I'm, I'm not saying we should erase masculinity, it wouldn't make sense, it would, it would mean probably philosophically nothing. Um, uh, but it's to erase the violent part of that, uh, the way of uh, treating women, the way of treating queer people and everything. And on the other side is, is this dream, is this dream of a society where masculinity could be an option among others and could be an option also for women, you know, if a woman wants to be masculine and everything, that could be, that could be an option. And, and Judith Butler in the Gender Trouble uh, really wrote about that. What would be the possibility of gender as a performance? So as not something violent, but as something that you could choose to perform and an identity that you could play with, you know? And so of course I'm not, and I know there is, for example, in the US a strong movement of, uh, of uh, uh, of, of, of like criticizing masculinity, masculinity and everything, and, and I think it's uh, more than important. But uh, in a way, like I don't know, I would I would never condemn someone who is in a couple where someone is uh, performing masculinity. You know, if the people are happy like this, I'm not a policeman. I'm not going to chase people and say you should play this way, you should play this way. You know, when I have sex with people, sometimes I love to play roles of masculinity and of submission, and of, but it's a it's a it's a it's a game, and so it became something entirely different. And so the the the, the, the ideal would be to build identity as a. Uh, and gender identity and others' identity as a, as a system of, of, of choices. But I know it's a crazy dream. <laughs> but we will try as much, a, as, much a, as much as we can. And, uh, oh, amazing. Those. We just got room for one more. Yeah. <laughs> Does this work? Hey. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Um, 
Donc, <coughs> sorry, I have to think in English now. That might take a minute. <laughs> um, I, um, I wanted to thank you very much, firstly, uh, because I come from Mauritius, as does my partner. And, um, you, co you come from where? Uh, Ile Maurice. Ah, Ile Maurice. Oui, en effet. And um, when I was reading your book, I could see elements of, you know, my mother's family and, and my, my in-laws reflected in it. These are, you know, realities that are firmly anchored back home. And, um, and I think that, you know, if, if it's affected me and I come from 6,000 miles away, that this must have, you know, fait le tour du monde, au fait. Um, and I was wondering if that could not, uh, in the end, sort of lead to perhaps um, like a, glo a global project of, of sorts, perhaps empowering other people. I, I don't know if, if both of you have any sort of plans for that, that could elevate uh, these voices and, and perhaps encourage other people, mm -hmm. you know, like you, like me, and like, you know, other people who have grown up in these conditions mm -hmm. to, to write about them. And, mm -hmm if that was, you know, in your projects at some stage, because you've been translated everywhere, and I, and I guess you get these comments from, from everybody now, mm -hmm. but, yeah. No, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I write because, because I want people to talk, you know, and uh, I, want, I want people to see that ex some experiences, some scenes, some interactions, some things that they experience during their life, is meaningful and is something that deserved to be said, you know, because um, narrative, narration doesn't mean anything as such. The question is like, what do we socially and collectively and in our society build as something that can be told, that is worth being told, you know? And so what I try to talk about when I try to write about is to try about things that are not often said uh, in, in the literary field, to say this is things that deserve to be said, you know? and and and. And uh, uh, um, some people were telling me, uh, uh, but uh, so when you write, you don't have any uh, pudeur. Uh, uh, how do we say it in English? Pudeur? Modesty. Uh, modesty? For, for pudeur? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and I say, no, because what we call pudeur or modesty uh, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the border between what can be said and what cannot be said. And what I want to say is what cannot be said, you know? And, and, and you know, when, when, one, of the, one of the best uh, things that anyone told me in my life, uh, I was in, in South America for my, for my uh, first book, The End of Eddie, and someone told me, uh, it's the best book I've read about the favelas. <laughs> and um, and it was it was so strong it was so strong for me to hear that because uh, at my level I remember that when I, I started to read the novels from Toni Morrison I remember like she's this, they are the best books about my life that the best book about my childhood you know because because through the, the through the power she's the, the powerful work she's building the, the power of her books the strength of her books. She makes me able to realize so many things in spite of all the, all the differences, you know? And, and, and I hope that every single life being described, every, every single reality being shown up can be um, a, a tool for a wider imitation for people to talk about their life. Probably, uh, probably the, 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 the gay movement would have not existed without the anti-racist movement, you know, because they were thinking, okay, you know, there was, there was a kind of pattern, there was a kind of, of, of there was um, a, a dynamic like this. And also, to, to finish, because um, I have to finish at some point, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, uh, the thing is also, um, and I know it's not a very fashion thing to say in the English uh, world uh, most of the time, but for me it's very, also very difficult. It's also very important to to talk about uh, what what is not part of our lives. You know, to talk about all other lives, to, other, to talk about other bodies, to talk about other people. You know, some people call it uh, appropriation. Some people call it. Uh, but I don't see things this way. I really believe that. You know, it was, it was at the center of my book, History of Violence, when I uh, endured the sexual violence, and suddenly you realize that you have, you have to talk about it again and again. You have to go to see the police, you have to go to see the doctors, you have to go to see the, the, the judges, you have to go to see, uh, you have to talk about it again and again. And I remember thinking, why don't I have someone carrying my story for me, you know? And I truly believe that we are not responsible 
for our suffering, you know? When you are being thrown in our world and people call you Jewish and people call you women and people call you faggot, you didn't choose that. I didn't choose to be called faggot, you know? And so if I don't want to, to fight against that, that's my right, you know? Why should it be my struggle considering the fact that I didn't choose it, you know? So it's my struggle, in fact, but I don't want that to be imposed. And I think that there is obviously a very beautiful thing in, in carrying other people's pain for themselves, you know? And so if what they say is not true, if what they say is caricatural, or if only white people are talking about uh, people of color and only straight people are talking about queer people, then it became a structural and institutional problem, which is a different problem. But this ability of, of, of talking on behalf of someone else, for me, this is, this is the theory of the, the theory of uh, Edouard Glissant. This is a theory of the, of the, of the two monde. This is a theory of, 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 of what, what good things we can create out of globalization. You know, Edouard Glissant would say there is the violence of globalization, the erasure of, of differences, of some cultures, of some language and everything, but we can turn it into something else. Since we are all linked, we are all linked with new media, new languages, new ways and everything, this is a strong opportunity for us to create something new, you know? And so I want people to talk on my behalf. I want, I want to write something and throw it and say to people, now it's your issue, you know? When, when there is a Seattle adaptation of history of violence, I'm so happy because I think this is not my struggle anymore, you know? I had enough of that. Now it's your struggle. And, and this is really what I, I want to do with my books. I, I, I really want people to, to take my struggle for me. <laughs> well, on that note, could you please all take Edouard's struggle by heading to the book bookstore <laughs> there and buying some of the books? Um, can we all just thank Edouard so much thank for you. an thank extraordinary you. evening? Thank, thank you so much.